you, and uh, thank you for such a lovely introduction, and thanks to Chuck. Oh, it's not bad. Okay, we're fine. Good. Um, Chuck and uh, working. Chuck and Bobby for inviting me, and of course everybody here for being involved, because being involved is is critically important. Which is a little bit about what I'm going to talk about in this talk, which is just turning up the volume. I haven't used a PC in ages, so hopefully I won't break it. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that the Richard Dawkins Foundation has been doing. And um, I hope most of you, if not all of you, have visited our website, richarddawkins.net. Pretty easy to find. If you type in Richard's name, it's the first thing that pops up. It is the most popular secular website of its kind, and we now have one in Spanish language which is, um, it's not just a matter of translating articles into Spanish, it's just not using Google Translate. It's its own web page run by a small band of very dedicated people down in Mexico City, and we also have people from different parts of the Spanish-speaking world who contribute to the website. They search for news articles that are relevant to their culture, and we're hoping to do things like this in the future for other uh, minorities and other languages so that we can get the word out. Uh, we also have, many of you have seen some of our vignettes, which is just a, Richard Dawkins does a brief uh, explanation of some part of evolutionary biology. Uh, some of them have been done in the Galapagos and other areas. Plus, we always try to put on lectures on to our website. Um, many of them are Richard's lectures but some of them are other very popular speakers. In fact, uh, Lawrence Krauss uh, is proud to say that his wonderful talk that he gave at, uh, in fact, it was an AAI convention, conference in Los Angeles, uh, something from nothing, has hit well over a million viewers. Now that's pretty good for physics. And uh, of course, Lawrence is, is a lovely person to listen to and talented. And if he hadn't have been a physicist, he should have been a stand-up comic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we also try to keep a lot of original content on the website. Richard writes articles. We sometimes can convince and coerce some other people to write articles and send them to us. Uh, we, have, um, we also reprint, of course, articles that are relevant to our movement, relevant to science, relevant to what's going on in the world. Uh, it varies day to day. It's constantly updated. And uh, we have discussion threads uh, for each of those articles. And we also have a discussion section for people to bring up their own topic and have discussions. And we moderate. I will let you know that. Uh, we think moderation is, is important. Uh, we feel like Richard Dawkins Foundation website is a home to many and we just don't let anyone into our home. So if people start becoming obnoxious and threatening, uh, we smite them. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, we also, we do have interactive participation with, within our, uh, you know, the people that come in to our website. And we also, of course, often post what's going on uh, events around the world for other secular organizations, like-minded organizations. And we have an events calendar. I'm not going to talk about it too much because it's going to be uh, within, I hope, where's Johnny? A month. It will, um, it will no longer be necessary. And Johnny's going to be talking about that right after me. Um, a very exciting project that Richard Dawkins Foundation, SCA, and Michael Lewis and Johnny Montserrat have been involved in for, um, for at least a year. I guess it's been. So we also try to do a lot of cross-pollination with um, posting articles by members of the secular community and we, you know, linking to other sites and other blogs. And I, I do know that people have told me that if I post an article or something of theirs on our site, that immediately their, their views go up because we redirect them to their site. So we try to be very generous about getting people to other places. 
uh, we want people to be involved. Becky Hale was talking about that, and it's so important getting people involved in whatever organization you know, really does seek them in particular. So we also try to form community. You, um, Seth mentioned the Out Campaign, which really truly is a grassroots movement. Uh, it was started uh, just when we started the website, basically. And we didn't have any money to spend on it, and we just put it up on the website. We had our Scarlet A, and yes, the Scarlet A was quite, um, was quite um, purposeful because of, as Becky mentioned, um, I will tell a little tale on Richard Dawkins. After about, I don't know, a year of the Scarlet Letter being around and becoming pretty ubiqu ubiquitous, he finally turned and said, uh, why, why do you call it the Scarlet A instead of the Red A? <laughs> I went, oh yeah, you're a foreigner. Um, you did not have to read Hawthorne. And so I believe it was Andy Thompson ran out and got a book of uh, The Scarlet Woman. And um, I don't know if he read it, but he, did, he stopped asking those kind of questions anyway. <laughs> Um, and of course, we had non-believers giving aid. We've been, um, you know, trying to show that in fact atheists are warm-hearted, and we do actually donate a lot. Uh, it is interesting to note that the religious group that donates the least are Buddhists. It's pretty interesting to, to know. Um, support. We also support uh, the child care for conferences. We try to support other secular and educational organizations, often by just having Richard show up for an event, or speaking well of them, or you know, posting things on their website, on our website. We also have been working with um, Pitchdown Press, and um, they are a little publisher in the South, of all places. And it started with Andy Thompson's book, who I, I hope all of you got a copy of that and had him sign it, it's a great book. It started with Andy's book, uh, Kurt Volkan and pitched on the press was uh, they ended up meeting and started talking and Andy wrote this little book and since then we've had a number of secular books that have been going to pitch on the press so they have this little niche and I thought David you know, Moses book we, we, you were in pitch on the press but um, Catherine Stewart Herb Sil uh, I'm sorry Herb Silverman Andy Thompson others went through pitch on but we also promote other books such as David Miosis and Catherine Stewart's. Um, let's see. Now we also have a store, and I notice I'm always happy to see people wearing certain um, t-shirts and a pins and things that uh, go around. And this, if you haven't met her, she's usually at conferences, and this is um, our store goddess, Susie Lewis, and she uh, runs the store, and it's, it's, she does a great job, and she's always one of those people who are really cheerful when everybody else is panicked and trying to figure out what's going on, she generally is the calm voice. So I hope you get a chance to visit our store. We have, <coughs> excuse me, the A pins, the t-shirts, hats, mugs, all kinds of things. And in fact, I'm going to share with you, um, this is a shirt that was designed by Richard Dawkins himself. And uh, if you can't read religion too, you can find it here. And I do have one here. <laughs> I didn't even like to start the bidding, but I'd be happy to give this away to someone today. Um, I won't actually actually bid. But we also have things like bags. It, it does. <laughs> I, I often use these bags when I go shopping, and um, I'm not sure what people think when they see it. <laughs> I've gotten a few looks. Anyway, and also as you know, Richard does continue to tour the U.S. Uh, he seems to have this boundless energy, and this. Coming fall, uh, September, is it September 1st now? Yes. Right, so then I can say this month he will be here in the U.S. And while he visits the U.S., often he uh, supports other organizations. I know when the Reason Rally was going on, he went to CFI and helped raise money, he went to AA and helped raise money, he went to um, AHA, he's helped raise money, I know he's helped raise money for AI, oh, no, AAA now. <laughs> It dates me, doesn't it? I still say that. Yeah. Um, and of course, he continues to write and to point out the obvious for which he often um, is heavily criticized. 
um, misinterpreted and um, you know it can be kind of a free-for-all for people so his next book is if you've not heard of it it's uh, it's his first autobiography it is it's called the appetite for wonder making a scientist uh, he has um, this book will uh, is it goes from his birth, not that he has a memory of his birth, but his mother helped him out on um, remembering that. His mother's uh, still alive, and, and uh, she had kept a journal and was able to go through some of the early things that happened through Richard's life. It's, as always, with Richard's books, you know, enjoyable to read. And then it goes up to his writing of the selfish gene. And then it's a bit of a cliffhanger because it stops there, so you don't know what happened, right? So you have to buy the next book. We're getting smarter about marketing. And as you know, Richard's never shied away from you know, taking risks and, and, and or attacks. And sometimes, you know, these attacks, especially late, seem to be coming as much from within the secular community as from outside. He is a lightning rod for controversy. And too many times, journalists and bloggers, uh, when they're unable to think of something original to say, they simply go, well, let's uh, make some negative comment about Richard Dawkins, that'll sure to get some attention. And it does. But still, he goes out there, he doesn't shy away from it, um, much like Miriam, not in the same way, he doesn't get too many death threats like you have, but he's out there fighting the good fight. So this book will be released at the end of September, the last week of September. And he will be uh, in New York City, Washington, D.C., Chicago, San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, Los Angeles. Uh, if you go to our website, it's on the events calendar. You can go get your tickets through there. Two events have been sold out so far, the one in Seattle and the one, one in New York at the Hudson um, <coughs> Society. But there are still tickets available. Uh, around, so if you get a chance, do go to the website and get there. The, um, he won't be giving the sort of standard lecture either. This is going to be a conversation on stage. If any of you have gone, and gone to our website and see some, seen some of the conversations that he's had with Lawrence Krauss and, and others, uh, this will be a conversation on stage. It'll be a different interviewer each and every time. Uh, there will be um, It'll talk about, hopefully, it'll just uh, naturally go from one, uh, one question to other in a natural flow, and it, will, it should be really nice, and there will always be a Q&A, and there will, of course, be a uh, book signing, which is always good. There will also be a number of media events, and hopefully you will um, uh, keep in touch by going to the website and again look at the events and we, we try to keep up with all the media. Um, for the uh, lecturers that we have, we have some, uh, I mean for the interviewers that we have, we have some really uh, amazing people. We have uh, Dr. Rebecca Goldstein who will be interviewing Richard in New York. We have Jamila Bay in DC, Peter uh, Bogosian in Portland, Adam Savage in San Francisco, and Michael Schirmer in Los Angeles. Those are just a few of who will be interviewing him. So again, just go to the website. We'll also be having some private events. Those will also be announced on the website um, shortly. And we also will be putting it on Facebook and Twitter. So be sure to um, uh, sign up for our, our Twitter accounts. As Richard went first called it, he asked me, he says, so, so what's a twit? <laughs> like, no, it's tweet, Richard. And unfortunately, once he got a hold of Twitter, I, there have been a couple times I've wanted to threaten to cut his fingers off. And I, please don't tweet anymore, Richard. Just, just please. But um, you know, he, as I said, he doesn't. Uh, he's not one to be told what to do. I know that. So he has a lot of fun with his tweets, and you can you can sign up for it. And also, you know, our email updates. And our email updates include everything from articles to what other groups are doing and some interesting things that are going on that we think people should be aware of. We try not to um, put too much spam into your mailbox. Our, we've really been increasing our social media and uh, 
this work has been done by Joel uh, Goodemson. He's worked on with a lot. He's worked with SSA. He works with uh, Jay Ruff. He's he's been he's amazing uh, person who has really built up our Facebook and our Twitter, and we are doing Google Plus and email alerts, as I just said. But he's really been the person behind getting that all up and running, and again, to, you know, turning up the volume, letting as many people as we know, you know, get get the word out, and hopefully they'll pass it out too. So the word, you know, we also are have now, uh, you know, have a newsletter that goes out at least once a month. We have action alerts to let people know if there's something particularly going on. Um, and we're hoping that we'll get to the point it'll go to an area, specifically an area, to let people know that, um, say, the school board meeting in somewhere in Texas is about to allow creationism back in school. We also have SOS, Save Our Secularism. And again, it's just to let you know what's going on that you might be of interest. And then Google Ads, which is uh, something new, kind of new and exciting, that allows us to reach people who are not part of the secular movement and maybe trying to look up something like, who is God? And hopefully the Google ad that we place will entice them to come actually find out. So that's, that's a good thing. Now, that, those are the things that have been going on with the Richard Dawkins Foundation, just a few of the things. Uh, we've been around since 2007, shortly after Richard published The God Delusion. But, I want to go back a little bit and just talk about the sense, the, the, what the Richard Dawkins Foundation really is. And obviously being built on someone's name, it reflects Richard's uh, personality, it reflects who he is and what he's done. And Richard has inspired millions since his first publication of The Selfish Gene. I know it made a big difference in my life. And it's ever so often when Richard's in signing cues, it's quite touching when um, someone says, I went into science because of you. And I've seen people bring in books, uh, original copies of The Selfish Gene that are dog-eared and notes. And one young man said, well, this was my father's book and he left it to me. Will you sign it? And it's very, very touching. And it inspires Richard as much as it inspires people to read his book. The Extended Phenotype, his next book, is my personal favorite. It really made a big difference in how I thought about psychology and, of course, biology. And we are biological creatures. So, of course, it has an effect on human behavior. It, um, these two books combined, the, the extended phenotype was written more for scientists than for lay people, but it's still a, a, a fairly, you know, it's not a difficult book to read and I highly recommend it, but it certainly has caused a lot of people to think differently about biology and about the world around them. And not very many people get the opportunity to do something like that, and I think Richard realizes that he is privileged in that way. Richard's subsequent books enlightened us and impassioned us about the beauty of science. And he made us realize that just as one does not need to be a concert pianist to appreciate the music and talent of Glenn Gould, nor does one have to have a PhD in science to understand how genes might build a rose. We can understand the beauty of science without being a scientist. And this is important. And this is what needs to be passed on. This is the goal of Richard's life, is to make science something that everyone wants to enjoy, that makes every child jump up and down and say, wow, that is really cool. And Seth's talk earlier, I mean, a wonderful talk, but you know, parts of it are so sad because these children are, are insulated, they don't get the opportunity to jump up and down and say, wow, isn't that cool? And what could be better for any child than that? In his, when The God Delusion was published, um, he was slightly embarrassed 
that it became so popular because it's not a science book. And I remember the, when the website was coming up online, we would get people writing in, and one person wrote in, well, who is this Richard Dawkins guy that he, you know, what's his qualifications? Well, who is he? <laughs> okay, we're reaching a whole new audience. And that's great. And now when Richard travels around in the U.S., people recognize him and thank him for his work that we would have never thought of 10 years ago. Baggage handlers, TSA agents, taxi cab drivers say thank you for your work, thank you for that book, and thank you for speaking out. So that's a pretty incredible thing. And then we hope they go back and pick up a copy of The Selfish Gene or Unleaving the Rainbow and read about the other parts of Richard's life because that is truly his passion as science. Um, the God Delusion also uh, helped the economy by spawning a cottage industry of books that were anti-Richard Dawkins. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it, it, simply trying to say that Richard doesn't get it. He's not a theologian. How could he possibly know that there is no God? And Richard kept on writing after, become, after the selfish uh, the God Delusion. And he wrote The Greatest Show on Earth, which is a wonderful book. And the ancestors, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, I have the ancestors tale on there. Uh, that was before. But the uh, greatest show on earth, the ancestors tale, and of course his latest book uh, <coughs> uh, directed toward young, a younger audience uh, called The Magic of Reality. The publisher doesn't want us to call it a children's book, it's a crossover book. But um, it has become very popular, and it is on, a, you can get it on an iPad, which is really fun. It's cool, you get to blow up frogs. And, that's the science part of me speaking there. So Richard does keep on writing. And yet he is probably will always be paid as the most famous atheist. But I do think after reading his autobiography, you, you will understand that his first love, his reason for being <coughs> is science and conveying his passion to others. His passion is indeed infectious, if you've ever heard his lectures on any kind of topic of science. And understanding that sort of passion is actually not very difficult. This is from my home in uh, Colorado Springs. I was just there. I spent the last uh, 10 days in Elbert, Colorado. It's actually technically Elbert, so I don't have to say I'm from Colorado Springs. Um, as Becky Hale in, uh, mentioned, <laughs> the Colorado Springs is sort of an odd place sometimes. Um, but it is Elmer, Colorado, so we have both Evolve Fish and the Richard Dawkins store in the El Paso County of uh, near Colorado Springs. So I think that actually says a lot. Now, our, my, my home is just on the uh, edge of the Black Forest. And of course, many of you heard about the Black Forest fires back in June of this year, and they were pretty devastating. I think it was something like 998 homes were burnt to the ground. And surveying the area, it's pretty, it's pretty terrifying. And that fire moved really quickly. And we, we of course, had to evacuate. The, uh, and if the winds had not shifted when they did, uh, the store, the house, everything would have been gone as well. So I thank the firefighters for keeping the, uh, the fire bricks solid. As far as the shift in the wind, I really have no one to thank for that. Now, Colorado is an absolutely beautiful state. It is a geologist's dream. Birders from around the world have talk, spoken to me about Colorado because we get the Great Plains coming up from the east and we have the Rockies uh, on, on the west side of the state. And so we get a lot of migratory birds. We get quite a, a bit of wildlife. So while this was a working trip when I went back to Colorado, I now live in DC, and I was able to take a break from work and go do some hiking and sightseeing with a friend of mine who had never really been, he'd been to Colorado Springs, but never really had a chance to see much of it. So we did the usual touristy stuff, which is always fun. You know, took the tram up to Pikes Peak. How many people have done that? 
And I'm sure Becky, like me, you probably go out every time somebody visits or <laughs> back up the mountain. But it's always nice um, to go and you always see something different. So we hiked around Cheyenne Canyon and uh, Castlewood State Park. There are uh, some beautiful areas to go hiking. But on the very first day, we went to Garden of the Gods. How many of you have been? Garden of the Gods, I think, is probably the most beautiful city park in the world. It is a city park. It was bequeathed to the city under the condition, uh, something like 400 and something acres, that it be preserved and that it was always free to the public. But what is really pretty interesting about the Garden of Gods and Colorado Springs, because um, you can see Garden of Gods from pretty much anywhere in the springs if you're high enough up. It does represent sort of this disparity between science and religion and what we're up against. Seth talked about it quite a bit. And I mean, these, these magnificent formations, these are the kissing camels. If you look closely, you can see the, uh, the moon right under their kiss. But the, uh, these formations took millions of years to form. You can find riverbeds that have been turned on end, and the soft red stone has been shaped by geological time. Wind, rain, ice, water, floods. Its beauty is nothing but inspiring. And in fact, when Richard was out filming uh, the Blue Wall Eagle, he was in Colorado Springs, and he too was struck in awe of the beauty of this little park in the midst of Colorado Springs. Sunrise and sunsets are some of the best times to enjoy its magic and the eastern plains. The rocks really do glow. They glow as an effect when you go back. They glow. And if you're out in the distance, they, they sort of look like flame shooting up to the sky. You can hear falcons screech as they're swooping down on prey, and often you can see deer grazing quietly or Rocky Mountain sheep standing, perched, <coughs> looking over their territory. This area screams nature. It shouts the depth of all geological time. It roars evolution in all its magnificence. And yet, Again, referencing back to Seth's talk. Not far from this splendor lay the buildings that focus on the family and the New Life Church, uh, the native church of Ted Haggard fame. These radical Christian sects have ensconced themselves in Colorado Springs, and their brand of willful, willful ignorance by denying the reality of the world, denying evidence and blaming perceived ills on secularism, humanism, homosexuality, feminism, and of course, atheism. Children in Colorado Springs have the great lessons of geology and geological time literally in their backyards. It is difficult to avoid seeing those red monoliths, and yet far too many of these children are taught that the evidence gathered by thousands of scientists is wrong, and that a book written 2,000 year old, 2,000 years old, uh, 2,000 years ago, that um, by the way I don't believe was peer reviewed, <laughs> <laughs> of unknown authorship, wins over all that scientific evidence. These rocks, they are told, are carved by God for His glory. And again, Seth's talk talked about the insular, uh, how they insulate children, and that's exactly what they do. They're not allowed to see these things. They go, they start out going to their Christian daycare and then their Christian school, and then they go to the church where they have, I mean, the Ted Haggard thing is amazing, it's huge. And they get nothing else fed to them. Every Easter, thousands gather to hear a sunrise service at the Garden of the Gods. This was a while back. 
Now, it is inspiring. It is a beautiful, beautiful place. And I do sometimes wonder if, well, would they be surprised to hear that most of us in this room, standing in that, in that spot watching the sun rise from the east, but would they be surprised at how inspired we are, how we get chills going up our spine. It can bring tears to your eyes. It's so beautiful. Would they be surprised knowing that we too are filled with a spirit? Spirit simply means breath. I sometimes think standing at the base of those mount of those rocks that you can almost feel the breath of a living planet. If they knew we felt this, they would try to say, well, that's God. You're feeling God, how can you not believe in God? But we know different. We're filled with something much more deep, much more beautiful than their little God can fulfill. I can only speak for myself, but when looking at those stony faces reflected <coughs> in that first light of day, I am filled with a sense of gratitude for this tiny bit of time I have here on Earth. I am grateful for the centuries of scientific inquiry that have unveiled how I got here, how those rocks got there, how they were formed, how life fills every little niche in a special way through natural selection, all carved out over the millennia. I am grateful that I understand to a small degree that the light penetrating the shadows come from a star, and we are spinning around it. And we have, for, as we have for billions of years, and that star is just a part of a galaxy with millions of other stars, and that galaxy is part of the universe of millions and billions of other galaxies. Knowing that, in the brief amount of time I've had here on Earth, is magnificent. I am grateful, too, for every teacher I have had who has given me the opportunity to learn, to wonder, to allow my curiosity to fly for as long as I have a breath left. I am grateful to the scientists, technicians, and innovators, and inventors who have made our world more and more knowable. And Richard Dawkins has been one of those people who inspired me. And this is his passion. And I am grateful that he passed it on to me in a way he has. So when I stand there in the shadow of the real rock of ages, I also weep for every child who has ever been denied such wonders because of religious fear and its loathing of the truth. I become angry thinking about the insular world in which children are imprisoned and kept from knowledge and having their curiosity strangled. All children start out as little scientists. Killing that curiosity, I think, is one of the truly great sins of mankind. And that is why the Richard Dawkins Foundation exists. It is his passion and his vision. Because try as religious zealots might to destroy a child's curiosity and form him or her into small-minded little sheep, there will all be, always be those who will find a way to escape, who want that knowledge. And we hope RDF will always be there along with organizations like yours. We want to work alongside you. We want to be there when someone comes looking for the answers. This is our passion. This is Richard's passion. This is why we are here. And I want to close with Richard's words. I know many of you have heard this, but it's so beautiful. We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they are never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will, live, who will in fact never see the light of day, outnumber the grains of sand of Arabia. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because a set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively exceeds a set of actual people in the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I 
in our ordinariness that are here. We privileged few who won the lottery of birth against all odds, how dare we whine at our inevitable return to that prior state from which the vast majority have never stirred. Thank you. to actually make a comment. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I also wanted to just thank the Richard Dawkins Foundation and Dawkins because if I can list maybe three people who have been most supportive of all the work that I do, I think Richard would be one of the top three for sure. Um, you know, from, from everything, from moral, financial, um, just uh, uh, promoting our work, getting it known, um, you know, even publicizing all our campaigns and requests for funding or support on the website. So I just wanted to thank the foundation and Richard for everything he's done. Well, thank you for giving us the opportunity to help you because your work is so incredibly important. Thank you. I'm just curious. <clears throat> When people come to you and say you're doing the devil's work, <laughs> what are your reply? Oh gosh, um, I've actually, I've had some <coughs> odd conversations. We do get a lot of letters praying for us, and of course, I, I don't know if you've seen Richard's hate mail, uh, he did a video of that. If you haven't, go to the website, type in hate mail, Richard Dawkins, it'll come up. It's, it's quite amusing, um, but um, I mean, I've had... The response I've mostly had has been sort of stunned. They're just stunned that I'm an atheist. And I personally, while well, I've had some threats and things and people saying mean things to me on the emails or letters, one on one I've never had any, any real issues with anyone um, except for my sister-in-law, but we won't go into that. <laughs> don't have a question because I've read all of Richard's books, most of Richard's books. And oh, not as new one, though. No, not as new one. You can get it through our website. You can go to our store. <laughs> um, I have given the magic of reality to adults, and it is not at all talking down to many no. adults who have no science background. And actually, um, the pictures, particularly the illustration with the, the books and the number of people, it, it really gives people who don't have any science background a really good idea about what's going on. The other thing is that even though I was not raised in a religious household, I did go to Catholic school my whole life, so I had religious people all around me, and it was the God delusion that finally made me realize that there was, it wasn't, the problem wasn't me. Because I spent most of my life thinking something was wrong with me for not believing. Yeah, I have, yeah, I have the same thing. Yeah, I have the same thing. Because I mean, my parents are nominally Catholic, but I keep going, why can't I believe this? And I tried really hard to believe, and you do feel like there's something wrong with me that I can't believe this. And it was his book that finally gave me the courage to go, no, I, I'm, there's not a problem for me. Good. I'm glad you did. It's funny because um, when the book first came out, a lot of people criticized it and said, well, it's great for atheists, you know, you kind of sing preaching to the choir sort of thing. And people um, you know, just said, you're not out, you're not gonna convert anyone. Well, yes we did. <laughs> um, Richard gets lots of comments and signing cues of people, you know, they were probably already questioning, um, the thoughts were there in their head, but then either Richard's book or Christopher Hitchens' books or uh, Sam Harris' books, I mean, had finally galvanized and allowed them to, well, come out. Like to say. Um, briefly, uh, one of the photographs is Professor Dock is actually a t-shirt kind of guy? Um, yes, he will, uh, but with a jacket. 
<laughs> and, and secondly, has he expressed any opinion of his portrayal on South Park? <laughs> He did not like South Park that much because he complained that the guy didn't have a very good British accent. <laughs> he loved being on The Simpsons. So, how many saw The Simpsons episode? Yay! Yeah. It was really, we had such a great time. I happened to be there when we were filming, when they were doing it. And it's a riot. It's, they're, they're hysterical to work with. And uh, Richard had a great time. So, it was, uh, he was, do, they had him doing it, trying to do an evil laugh. I, we do have that preserved. We'll be using it sometime in the future for something special, probably to get him to stop tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, Lewis. Hi, Lewis. Um, when do we start bidding on the shirt? <laughs> <laughs> How about if I just let you have it? Okay. Oh. <laughs> So I know that Richard Dawkins has been producing a lot of books over many, uh, many years. Um, has there been any effort on the part of the Richard Dawkins, Richard Dawkins Foundation to actually break out into other media, um, videos, or...? Yeah, well, we, we, we do have videos. We do have some of his videos available on our website. And some of the, the ones that we filmed are on the website for free. You can download it, or you can buy, the, some people like to still buy the DVD. Uh, we film, have filmed his lectures and things. And then he's done a lot of stuff on the BBC and Channel 4 and some independent filmmakers. And those we also make available, but we can't put them on the website for free because we don't own them. Um, we have tried to get him on, get US stations like PBS interested in, um, like The Root of All Evil or uh, the, the one he did recently about. Um, Supernatural and, and hocus pocus and things like that, homeopathy. But the we just don't. It's just not going to happen yet. I mean, when that happens, you know, we need more nons writing in and saying, "Hey, we want Richard Dawkins." Uh, so we, we hope to do that. But we will be um, doing some videotapes of videoing of his uh, book tour this this time. And we hope to start, we've got quite a bit of footage that we're hoping that uh, we can get some funding to have edited and get some more vignettes out. So it's definitely in the, in the goals, but you know, it's an expensive thing to do. But we do try to keep our DVDs fairly inexpensive. And uh, anyway. Uh, one last question from the MC. I'm gonna cheat. Oh, okay. Um, Richard Dawkins has been notorious in the past for not really wanting to talk a whole lot about himself. Right. Right? He's always deflecting to the information, talking about the evidence, talking about nature, talking about science. But this is a very introspective work, at the autobiography of Richard Dawkins. Did he have to be sort of like pushed into, hey, this is important? Or was it for him time to do a retrospective of his life? Yeah. It was, it was for a long time he, he really resisted it. Um, and I, I don't know, I can't speak exactly for Richard, but I think part of it was timing, part of it was how much the, his agents that he could get for the book. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and then in, in writing it the way he did, and breaking it, I think it's going to be a three-part series uh, for if he lives like his mother and father did. Uh, so, because um, they're, they they're well into their, well, his, his mom, mom, I think it's 98 now. But, it is, uh, it's, a, it's a beautifully written book. It's really interesting, and I, I think everybody will enjoy it, and I've had a chance to read it. It'll also be in audio form, at least about the same time. But yeah, it, he doesn't like to talk about himself very much, and it, I think it was difficult. But it helped. One of the things he said he really did enjoy, because his father just you know, passed away a little over a year ago. And it gave him an opportunity to sit down with his mother again and, and go over old photos and talk about his early young life in Africa. 
And I think that probably helped him maybe through his grief a little bit. And um, so, you know, timing, I think, was a lot. Everyone, Dr. Elizabeth Cornwell, thank you so much.